good evening to everyone and welcome to the India-Canada Friendship Circle, also known as ICFC. In keeping with Canada's Indigenous Peoples Custom and on behalf of ICFC members and our guests, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the lands on which we are gathered are part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabeg people. For those who are joining us for the first time, ICFC was founded in Ottawa in 2004. It is a registered nonprofit, non-religious, non-partisan organization that brings together people and prominent experts in a peaceful dialogue on diverse issues of interest to Canada and India. We are truly delighted that you could all join us here tonight, including our distinguished speakers, Dr. Catherine Asher from University of Minnesota, Dr. Supriya Gandhi from Yale University, and Dr. Kareem H. Kareem from Carleton University. My name is Ruhi Ahmed, and I'm the president of ICFC. I'll be chairing tonight's meeting overall, and I'm joined by our vice president, Dr. Stephen Desjardins, who will manage the technical side and, as I mentioned earlier, is recording this event. We are also joined by our fellow esteemed board members in Washington, Toronto, and Ottawa, Dr. Veena Rawat, Mrs. Malti Keserwani, Dr. Nipa Banerjee, Mr. Prakash Diyar, Ms. Ann Pollock, Mrs. Geetha Thakur, and our special advisor, Dr. Elliot Tepper. This is a fantastic team that I've had a privilege to, to work with for a number of years. Recognizing our volunteers um, usually gets left to the end. So this time I want to flip it around and I want to recognize two very special members up front, Mr. Anil Agrawal and Dr. Harsh Daheja. Both made significant contributions to ICFC over the years for which we are profoundly grateful. Stephen and I will address their efforts later in the program. I'd also like to give a special shout out to a good friend of mine, Mr. Rahel Khan, for his keen interest in supporting us in today's event. He is co-founder of Mahatma Gandhi Next Generation Leaders. Today's lecture is titled, Peace With All, From Temples and Palaces to the Taj Mahal. It is about India's syncretic wonders. This is the fifth event in a year-long lecture series under the theme Diversity and Inclusion, which we studied under various lens. For example, under the first lens, two senior dip diplomats, namely the Indian High Commissioner and a former Canadian ambassador and author, examined the governance of diverse communities and what comprises the Canadian and Indian identity. Our second lecture, featured two senior federal public servants who shared their perspectives on multicultural Canada and public service. Our third lecture marked the special occasion of National Indigenous History Month, where we learned of efforts by museum specialists and First Nations in Canada, how they collaborate on museums and cultural centers. Our fourth lecture has was a, a very dynamic one with a panel of athletes, a former sports anchor, an academic, and the Deputy High Commissioner of India, who all came together to talk about sports as a cultural unifier, with a special highlight on ice hockey and cricket. And finally, this brings us to the last lecture in our diversity and inclusion series today with a spotlight on the Mughal period in India. It, India has been a land of many civilizations, cultures, faiths, and languages that were brought to the native Indians by Indo-Aryans as early as 2500 BCE, followed by Greeks and Mughals in later years. It was a rich and vibrant country that has contributed in all fields of knowledge, arts, music, poetry, science, mathematics, astronomy, architecture, trade and commerce, to name a few. The guest speakers today will give us a glimpse of what a country can achieve by working together 
It was a period when Hindus, Muslims, and Christians, and other communities have lived together for centuries. And while there were uh, conflicts, there were also positive influences that they brought to one another in building common platforms for culture, art, music, and respect for one another's cultural and religious beliefs. They shared festivities and developed a common language. This was a period when Muslim generals worked faithfully for Rajput kingdoms and vice versa. Canada is also a multicultural mosaic, although it is a much younger country than its ancient counterpart, India. As Canadian cities continue to grow and diversify, opportunities arise to enrich and enhance the Canadian identity. But as we have learned our past in our past lectures, challenges do exist as differences in opinion naturally arise between communities of different traditions, income status, ethnicities, customs, and beliefs. As Canada navigates its way into shaping its identity further into the future, what can we learn from India's experience in managing diversity? Drawing on past examples of today's most populous and culturally diverse countries in the world, India, this lecture will attempt to look at a period in Indian history where kings and philosophers were able to harness their devotion to learning and building on the strength of unity in diversity. How did they achieve mutual tolerance and understanding of religious and cultural differences? What can Canada learn from these experiences and how can we build a pluralistic society for everyone? Without any further ado, it is my privilege to introduce the moderator of this panel, Dr. Karim H. Karim. Dr. Karim will introduce the theme and the speakers, and that will be followed by a question and answer period with the audience, and, uh, and then we'll have a call at nine o'clock. Dr. Karim, the Chancellor's Professor at Carleton University, has served as director of several academic institutions in Canada and the UK. He has been a visiting professor at Harvard, Simon Fraser, and Aga Khan Universities, and has delivered distinguished lectures around the world. Dr. Karim is also an award-winning author whose writings have been translated into several languages. His major publications include the critically acclaimed Islamic Peril, Media and Global Violence, uh, in, published in 2000 and 2003 the media of diaspora in 2003 which is an international reference of work and reimagining the other in 2014 engaging the other in 2014 and diaspora and media in europe in 2018 professor cream's most widely read article is the co-authored clash of ignorance in 2012 which critiques the clash, the clash of Civilizations thesis. His current research and publications examine religious intersections, particularly in Indic Islamic contexts. Dr. Karim, we are very happy that you could join us today, and I turn the floor over to you. Thanks very much, Ruhi. I'm privileged to be here. Greetings, salu, namaste, and salam to all. We are privileged to have presentations today by scholars who are going to share with us their research, knowledge, and insight about how people of diverse backgrounds came together in common cause, that of peace. Today we live in a troubled world in which differing identities and worldviews have increasingly become a source of friction. Over the last three weeks, in Ottawa, given the, the events in Ottawa, many Canadians were shaken with the realization that some of their fellow citizens think and act very differently from them. Various other countries are also suffering from domestic conflict due to sharply differing worldviews. As, as, as I speak, Eastern Europe faces the prospect of war as a result of what some would see as severe ethno-territorial disagreement. 
difference is not alien to the human condition, but a part of it. It makes sense that intelligent beings seek to come to terms with it. Democracy has sought to bring people of differing viewpoints to the table. Unfortunately, democracy has taken a lot of hits in recent years. Some would say because unscrupulous political actors have sought to exploit differences, mostly to enhance their own power. Where do we turn to bring peace and justice to our societies? Today's presentations turn back several hundred years to Mughal India to seek an enlightened approach to bring together people of differing worldviews. Perhaps we can find an answer for our times in that experience. Today's first speaker, whom it is my privilege to introduce, is Catherine Asher. She is Professor Emerita at the University of Minnesota. She is a renowned specialist in Muslim and Indian art from the 13th century to the present. Dr. Asher has published extensively on the Mughal dynasty and has examined the cultural patronage of their predecessors and successors, Muslim and non-Muslim. Her current work focuses on the architecture of Hindus, Jains, Muslims, and Sikhs in cities across North India, exploring not only architecture, but painting as well as luxury arts. She shows that contrary to common belief, these communities were more often in harmony with each other than in adversarial relationships. Professor Asher has also studied the commonality of the shrines of Sufi saints with churches and Hindu temples, which exhibit the existence of pan-Indian cultures that transcend religious affiliations. I would now like to invite Professor Asher to deliver her presentation. Um, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you today to talk to you about the Mughal policy of peace to all. Why don't we start with the most famous monument that probably all of you know that the Mughals built, and that is the famous Taj Mahal, built by the fifth Mughal emperor, Shah Jahan, who rules from 1628 to 15, uh, to 1650, I'm sorry, to 1658. He builds this tomb for his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal, who died giving birth to their 14th child. It's built over a very long period of time between 1632 and 47, and it's in the city of Agra. The Taj is extraordinarily famous. And we see in the 18th and 19th century, for example, both Indian and European artists rendered its likeness. We have in the upper left, we have Sitaram, a famous Indian artist. And below we have the more tranquil image by the father, uh, nephew, um, uh, uh, uncle team, the Daniels, um, that you see in the larger image. The Taj Mahal is so famous that it's also become uh, the focus of modern advertisements. For example, we have a Greek olive oil with an Arabic name whose image is the Taj Mahal, suggesting that it's the apex of quality. Or we see the Cunard um, line here and the steamship line that is evoking its customers a excellent rest. I don't think they mean an internal rest um, and in the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal is officially under the control of the government of India and it's part of the Ministry of Culture. But others have claimed the Taj is up well, for example, in 2008, the Muslim Vakt Board, that is the trust board 
of the state of Uttar Pradesh, that is UP, in which the Taj exists, claimed that they, it was their right as a Muslim community to protect the Taj. This went all the way to the Supreme Court. It was denied on the grounds that a <clears throat> trust board does not have the facilities to protect a monument as huge and as popular as India's best known monument, the Taj Mahal. But not only do various governmental agencies and perhaps Muslim communities claim the Taj, so too do right-wing Hindu political groups. And this book by P. N. Oak, The Taj Mahal is a Temple Palace, is an example of this sort of thing. What we see here is these political groups literally trying to erase a um, Muslim past and heritage by claiming that structures, splendid structures such as the Taj Mahal have a Hindu heritage, not a Muslim one. It is well known and well documented that Shah Jahan purchased legally the land on which the Taj Mahal sits from a very wealthy Hindu. But these political groups erase what is known from uh, documents and they claim that the Taj Mahal is no more than a pre-existing temple already on this land. Thus, by using India's most famous monument in this way, the Hindu right use art as a political weapon to, to promote their own pernicious agenda. But what I'd like to do now is go back in time and think about the policies of the Mughal state. Shah Jahan's personal munshi, that is secretary and administrator, whose image you see on the right, was a Hindu named Chandrabhan Brahman. He wrote texts on correct behavior, um, especially for diplomats and rulers. And in these texts, he saw Shah Jahan as an Indian ruler who happened to be Muslim rather than as a Muslim ruler. So how did this concept of state evolve? How did Chandrabhan Brahman see his overlord as a just ruler is what it basically comes down to. If we go back to the beginning of the Mughal dynasty, Babur, the first Mughal, founded this empire in 1526. Although the time that he founded it, it was very small, not exactly an empire. Among his multiple accomplishments in his four, short four-year reign was the introduction of gardens with pools and streams. This type of garden, known as a charbag or a four-part garden, is the kind of garden that we see at tombs such as the Taj Mahal. But these gardens were not just pleasure gardens. They weren't just symbols of paradise, as is often thought in the Islamic tradition. But they're literally visual metaphors of political control over vast India with its multiple religious and cultural traditions. Now, we have to recall that Babur and his successors, although they are Muslims, they are ruling over a population that is very largely non-Muslim. Most of these people are Hindus or a related religion. Aware of their minority status, the Mughals are extremely tolerant of other religions. This policy of toleration, known as Sulaikur or peace to all, comes about under the third Mughal emperor, Akbar, who rules from 1556 to 1605. 
and you see him here in a his balcony overlooking um, <clears throat> them and talking to his subjects. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more. So one of the questions that we want to ask ourselves is, how do we see this policy of Suleiko visually even before it becomes an official policy? Well, one way that we can see it is in the style of architecture that Akbar chooses for his palaces. In the words of his chronicler, they are built in what is called the fine styles of Bengal and Gujarat. Now, if you think of the geography of the Indian subcontinent, you realize that this means the fine styles of architecture that are built from the western part of India throughout the eastern part of India. In other words, he's using a pan Indic style. If we look at this architecture, we can see that it is not based on arches, as you might think for Muslim architecture, but rather it's based on a series of post and lintels. This is known as trabeated architecture. Trabeated architecture is an Indic style of building, but it is embraced by earlier Muslim rulers of India, and hence it becomes a pan-Indic style. We see here Akbar's private audience hall, and you can see that it is completely built in what is called the post and lintel style, that is, it's devoid of arches. What's remarkable is the central pillar that you can see here. And this serves as Akbar's throne. He would be seated on top of this pillar and his authority would spread out in all four directions of the world. This is an Indic concept of kingship, but he conflates it with Islamic ones. For example, in the center of this building, in the city of Agra or near the city of Agra, which his chronicler calls the center of India, the center of Hindustan. He's shown as being the pivot of the world. And he's also, so he's shown symbolically using this Indic style. Now, Akbar is a very interesting ruler and he engages in religious discussions of people of multiple faiths. We know from the text, the historical text, that he engages with <clears throat> Hindus, various groups of uh, Muslims, with Jains, um, Zoroastrians. And as you can see here in the painting, he's also engaging with priests, Christian priests, who have come from Goa via Portugal. These discussions have made Akbar even more tolerant than he starts off as. And he establishes this policy that I've already mentioned, Sulekul, or peace to all. In doing this, he conflates, as, as we saw in the architecture, both Muslim and Hindu practices of ideal kingship. And what we see here is how Akbar showed himself daily, every morning, at a window that overlooks his palace and is accessible to all. This, and you can see in the painting how this actually works. You can see the overall structure now overgrown uh, with trees in front of it, unfortunately. Um, in the upper left and a detail of this window on the right. This window is known as the Jiroka Edarshan, that is literally the window of beholding, of auspicious sight. And it's adapted from the Hindu practice of Darshan that is auspicious beholding. And here, for example, 
in a temple in Western India, we see devotees gathered outside the temple waiting for the curtain that you see in the lower right hand part to be opened, revealing an image of the Hindu deity. As you can see in my images on the left and center. Akbar is essentially emulating this practice. He's showing himself in the Indic manner as being a father to his people. But in the traditional Islamic view of kingship, he is accessible to his subjects. Akbar went further than this. He had the Sanskrit classics, such as the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, translated from Sanskrit into Persian, that is the Mughal court language. Moreover, he had them illustrated, for he believed that not only these translations, but further illustrating them would encourage understandings of other religions and practices. Now, Akbar was not alone in doing this, and this is how these things filter down. For example, his mother also owned an illustrated Persian translation of the Ramayana, that is this important Hindu classic text. And so too did Akbar's head of the entire military, um, who, a Muslim whose name is Abdurrahim Kane Kanan. Now, Abdurrahim Kane Kanan is a man of multiple hats. He had this uh, Ramayana made. It was completed the year of Akbar's death, 1605. And he has the classic Indian gods. We see Hanuman here on the right, and we see uh, Rama on the left, but depicted in a mogulized style. Even the format of the manuscript, vertical as opposed to horizontal, is an adaptation of a Mughal style. Abdurrahim Kanekanan also wrote poetry. He wrote poetry in Braj, a form of Hindi, under the name Rahim. And if we read just one of his short poems, we can see that he is for moderation and tolerance. Says Rahim, do not snap ever the thread of love. Once broken, it does not unite. If it does, knots appear. Says Rahim, do not spurn the trivial, seeing the weighty. When you need a sewing needle, what is the use of a sword? Says Rahim, keep your sorrow to your own heart. Others will taunt you. None are willing to share. Says Rahim, a man with no education, wisdom, religion, and generosity is an animal without tail or horns. Futile is his birth in this world. Another noble who served under Akbar, who was the Raja of a state named Bundi, a Hindu, favored the patronage of manuscripts with Hindu overtones. And we see here a page from what's called the Ragamala a musical text uh, whose um, specific uh, evokes the specific times of the day. This is the first time these texts have ever been illustrated. And here we see the god Shiva being worshiped. Now this is the kind of text that is usually assumed to be only associated with Hindu patronage. But it turns out that Abdul Rahim Kane Kanan also owned a manuscript of this Ragamala. As I told you already, a text usually only associated with Hindu patronage. 
So why would he own a ragamala that has this very distinct Hindu, Hindu subject matter in it, when it's usually considered to be of no interest to a Muslim patron? Well, it turns out it is the result of cultural interaction among elite friends. One a Muslim, that is the Kane Kanan, and the other a Hindu, the Raja, that is the king of a small state. For both of them, they knew that an appreciation of music reflected cultivated texts and ragamalas were considered especially important for elite men to cool their senses. Now, what we see here is that these two pages are very close. And it's now been learned that the pounce, that is the outline used to produce these paintings was owned by the Hindu Raja who served Abdul Rahim Kanakanan in the Deccan was his friend and lent him the pounces. Hence, we see visual confirmation of interaction between a Hindu elite and a Muslim elite. Now, Rajaman Singh, Akbar's highest ranking noble, was a Hindu, and he was a prodigious patron of architecture. He built mosques, for example, and this was one of his ways of spreading Akbar's policy of Sulaikul, just as the Kane Kanan's patronage of a translated Ramayana or a Ragamala text was his way of spreading the policy of Sulaikul. He also built a number of temples, including this one to his uh, heir apparent who sadly died early. But if we look at the details of the temple that you see on the left, you can see that it evokes the Mughal architecture that you see on the right. So the style of the building is used to evoke this policy of universal toleration. His largest temple is known as the Govinda Deva Temple, and he built it at a site that Akbar had been investing in very early, since very early in his reign. In other words, Rajaman Singh's patronage of this temple was more than just the patronage of a Hindu temple. It was reflecting the Muslim emperor's own generosity and taste. The interior of the temple is extremely Mughal in style. The exterior is not particularly. And it again is a visual reflection of the policy of Sulaikul. The construction of temples continues from the 16th at least into the time of Shah Jahan, as we can just see some examples on the screen here. Now, returning to the Taj, remember Shah Jahan built the Taj, and between um, 1632 and 43, and he also built, continued many of the policies of Akbar and his successors. He continues the policy of the Jarope Darshan. You can see this on the painting on the right. And here is the actual Jaroka. You see the side on the upper left as it would face the general public, and you can see it a little bit better from its back. The architecture of Shah Jahan, by and large, continues the post lintel style. While this mosque that he built looks as if it's arched, in fact, the roof is flat, so too we have a situation with his public audience hall that we can see here. And even in his throne, where you see this curved roof 
over the area in which he would sit enthroned. And this curved roof derives from the architecture of, of, in, of Eastern India. That is this pan-Islamic architecture that we saw first used by Akbar. His private audience hall continues the same pub post in Lindel con construction. And we see here in a painting the way it would have been embellished with red imperial fabrics. But the interior takes up a, a trend that we're going to see um, in the Taj, and that is the notion of paradise. We have a fantastically gilt marble interior, which today has mostly vanished. The marble is there, but little of the gilt. Through the middle of the building ran a canal known as the Canal of Paradise. And in the center was this lotus pool that was originally embedded with semi-precious stones. Now, in the a ceiling was an inscription that reads, if there be a paradise on earth, this is it, this is it, this is it. This paradise we can see is a conflation of multiple traditions from um, India's rich cultural tapestry. The Taj Mahal built for his favorite wife, whose portrait is on the left, we know is the most central Asian appearing construction of everything he built. But let's recall the words that I said at the beginning, the words of his Hindu secretary and administrator, Chandraban Munchi, who saw Shah Jahan as an Indian ruler who happened to be Muslim rather than as a Muslim ruler. Thank you. Uh, I'm honored to introduce uh, Supriya Gandhi, uh, who is an assistant professor uh, uh, at Yale University's Religious Studies Department. Uh, her research examines the interface of Muslims and adherents of Indic faiths in South Asia. Uh, Dr. Gandhi's interests include the religious and cultural history of the Mughal Empire, Islamic mysticism, the translation of Indic texts into Persian, and modern Hindu, Hindu thought. She grew up in India and studied in New Delhi and in the UK, as well as in Iran and Syria. Uh, this was prior to obtaining a doctorate at Harvard. Dr. Gandhi is the author of the book, The Emperor Who Never Was, Dara Shukho, in Mughal India. This is a nuanced biography of the prince who was a Sufi and an erudite scholar of Hindu thought. Uh, he was also the presumed heir to the throne but uh, did not actually become uh, the emperor. Uh, Dr. Gandhi's next project uh, explores the Persianate culture and uh, cultural and uh, intellectual ecumen in the making of modern Hinduism. Dr. Gandhi, please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, please go okay. ahead. Wonderful. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of Dara Shukru's engagement with uh, what we might today call Hindu thought, Hindu, Hindu ideas. Uh, now, now, Dara Shukru was the great grandson of Akbar, about whom we heard so eloquently from uh, Professor Seastrand. And in many ways, he tried to do what his great grandfather did without expressly acknowledging that he was his model. So Dada Shukru wanted to remake himself like a kind of Akbar, um, but also show that he had unique spiritual gifts that no emperor before him had had. So when he was young, he and his sister Jahanara, both in a rather um, unprecedented um, 
fashion, joined the Qadari order of Sufis as initiates. It was, you know, earlier typical for, the, for Mughal royals to patronize the Chishti order, but here they joined the Qadari order and they actually become initiated into this. Um, so, so uh, kind of from Shah Jahan back to Dara Shukur, you know, and Dara Shukur is, um, of course, uh, Shah Jahan's eldest son and heir. Um, and, and one of the most enduring ways in which he's remembered today is really his most unfortunate death. Uh, this is an image that we have that was commissioned by the Italian uh, traveler Manucci, who traveled around in India and wrote his, his own version of the, the struggle for succession, at the end of which Dara was killed. Uh, and here he makes Dara Shoko into sort of a Christian martyr, uh, showing uh, his actually his severed head being cut off and then presented to his um, sort of gloating uh, younger brother Aurangzeb who then succeeds the throne. So we so so Dara Shukur today is, is most famous really for for being the emperor who who never got to be emperor for 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 being deposed uh, by his uh, his younger brother Aurangzeb. Uh, and what I'd like to highlight uh, in this presentation um, is some of his really vibrant cultural and religious patronage, his own intellectual trajectory uh, towards the latter part of his life. Now, uh, in the 1650s, uh, you know, and he was, he was born in 1615, in the 1650s, we see his patronage really coming into its own. And this is at a time when Dara Shuko is pursuing both political power and spiritual dominion. So he's really trying to combine both. Today he's remembered more as the as the mystical prince, you know, who's in some kind of uh, of, of ivory tower, someone who is perhaps too too impractical to rule. But we see in this period that he's he's really ruling at the side of his father. This is an image from the Badshah Nama, uh, this great illustrated chronicle of Shah Jahan's reign, and we see Dara Shuko closely behind his father. Uh, you know, they're both being received by the, um, uh, the, the figure um, Khizr, who um, again has, um, uh, is very important uh, in Islamic mysticism. Uh, and this is when they're, they're going to Ajmer to subdue a Rajput revolt. So while he's managing these practical affairs of the kingdom alongside his father, he is also very busily trying to improve himself and advance spiritually. Um, one of the main ways in which Dara Shuko does this is with his dialogues with um, a Hindu ascetic, um, probably someone who was, um, again, a follower of uh, Kabir, known as Baba Lal. And um, Dara Shuko had a rather unsuccessful campaign trying to seize um, Kandahar, the city of Kandahar, back from the Safavids. Uh, in 1653. He was not the only Mughal to have failed at this. His brother Aurangzeb uh, had also failed earlier. You know, it was just uh, tactically very difficult. The Mughal artillery, uh, artillery wasn't great. And on his way back, he stopped at Lahore. He, was, he met his father in court. And then he had a series of dialogues with Baba La. And those dialogues were written down in Persian, uh, not perhaps in the exact form in which they actually uh, were held, there are different versions of these, but we can tell from these that by this time, Dara Shuko had started taking an interest in Indic texts, perhaps through even the same translations commissioned by his great-grandfather Akbar, and some were also commissioned by his grandfather Jahangir. So he was familiar with the Ramayan, and he has a number of questions, uh, philosophical questions, that he presses Baba Lal on. Uh, and this is an image of Dara Shuko with uh, with a Hindu ascetic that 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 may have depicted this, you know, or um, or another such encounter. In the 1650s, Dara Shuko had a number of interlocutors from different religious traditions. Uh, so this is just kind of briefly mapping out some of them. There were 
Hindu munshis, um, Persian literators who worked very closely with him in his household. One of them we saw in the earlier presentation, Chandarvan Brahman, who worked both for Shah Jahan as well as for Dara Shago and had actually accompanied Dara Shago to Kandahar. Uh, there's, there's another figure um, known in the sources as Jadav Das, uh, who penned down the dialogues from Baba Lal. There's Banwali Das Wali, who um, becomes a great author in his own right and writes mystical poetry and translates the Sanskrit play Prabodha Chandodaya into Persian. Dara Shuko also gets his father's court, and you know, again, Shah Jahan is actually hand in hand with Dara Shuko on this, to host Sanskrit pundits. So earlier, you know, there was the, the famous scholar Jagannath Pandita and then he also over a dozen times hosts the, the famous Kavindra Charya Saraswati, again, who was highly esteemed, uh, a highly esteemed scholar from Banaras. There were Jesuits as well, um, who uh, traveled, they had, they, there was a mission in Agra, who also had um, um, a certain amount of contact with Dara Shuko. Uh, Father Buse, you know, may indeed have, have had discussions with him uh, on topics relating to Christianity. And then there was the ascetic Sarmat, uh, who came from a, a Jewish background uh, and whose companion was uh, Abhay Chand was Hindu. Uh, and uh, together they actually collaborated to translate uh, the uh, Hebrew scriptures into Persian. So Dara Shuko had access to, again, sacred texts from, from the Hindu tradition, Christian tradition, and the Jewish tradition through his wide and eclectic range of interlocutors. Uh, he also had close contact with a number of Sufis. Initially, of course, the primary um, figures were his own Sufi peers, his spiritual preceptors, Mia Mir, uh, and, Mullah, and, his, who, and his own successor, Mullah Shah Badakhshi of the Qadri order. But there were others as well, Mia Bari, Shah Dilruba, Muhibullah Elahabadi, the famous Chishti Sheikh and interpreter of Ibn Arabi's writings. And another one of his important spiritual companions was his sister Jahanara, who really was in many ways a partner with him on the spiritual path. And indeed, um, and this is something I've discussed in my other writings, they composed their early Sufi works really in tandem, finishing them on the same date, the 27th of Ramzan, this auspicious day uh, in the Islamic calendar. Um, so we get a range of uh, his very vibrant intellectual and spiritual life. And this is a period where he's quite prolific. Uh, we can see tiny traces of his engagement with Indic thought in a work that he wrote in uh, 1646, the Risala e Haknuma, uh, where he um, outlines a series of practices uh, on the Sufi path and makes some reference to something that sounds like the Trimurti as well as to various yogic practices. But we don't see this um, overtly until his dialogues with Baba Lal, which were then written down. Uh, again, um, they're now extant in different recensions, so they're, they're different versions of these dialogues. Then in 1655, he composes a work that becomes quite famous, the Majmal Bahrain, the meeting place of two oceans, where he compares various Sufi ideas with um, a number of Indic ideas. You know, it's, uh, it's a really important turning point for him. After that, he gets a number of works translated, again, on the lines of Akbar, who got the Ramayana and the Mahabharata translated, as well as other works. He gets the Yoga Vasishta translated. Again, this is a, it's a Vedantic text uh, that has Ram uh, as a central figure, but the young Prince Ram, who is feeling um, a little aloof, dispassionate, he, he um, is not so enthusiastic about everyday temporal life. He wants to give up the throne. And then he has dialogues with the sage Vasisht, who leads him through a telling him a series of successive stories into a kind of liberation, a Jivan Mukti, a liberation in this life, so that he can be spiritually enlightened and also rule. And this is a work that uh, Jahangir got translated twice. There are two versions of this. So it's a work that was very much known in the Mughal court, but Dara Shukur wanted his own translation. And indeed, there was a version of this also done in Hindavi by, by Dara Shukur's um, interlocutor, uh, Kavindra Charya, uh, known as the Jnanasara. And then finally, this, um, all this output culminated 
in the Sirre Akbar, Tara Shukur's translation of about 50 plus Upanishads. It was the first time that we've had the Upanishads translated, um, uh, especially on this scale, and it proved to be a very influential work and also Tara Shukur's last work. So what I'm going to do now is to talk a little bit about a couple of these specific texts. Uh, so first, the Majmul Bahre or the meeting place of the two oceans. Again, this references a Quranic verse that is um, uh, has very much received the attention of Sufi commentators over the ages. Uh, and here Dara Shukho, um, uh, in his introduction, gives his reasons and his goal for this work. He, he calls himself uh, the uh, Fatir without a care, bi and du. Muhammad um, Dara Shukho relates that after discerning the truth of all truths, and ascertaining the mysteries of the subtleties of the Sufi school of truth and attaining this magnificent divine gift, he has now approached this purpose, namely to comprehend the nature of the school of thought of the monotheists or the unity affirmers, the Muvahedon of India, and the attainers of truth of this ancient people. So that Shoko, you know, he's quite confident in his own spiritual abilities, and he feels that, you know, under the tutelage of his Sufi peers, he has achieved a very high level of understanding. So after this, his next goal is to achieve the same understanding with regard to Indic thought. And again, he's, he's referring to Indic ascetics also as Muvahedon, as unity affirmers. Um, so, so not essentially different from the Sufi teachers uh, whose works he's, he has studied. So, uh, and he continues with some among them who've attained perfection, who've reached the extremities of ascetic practice, comprehension and understanding, the utmost levels of mystical experience, God seeking and gravity. He, again, Dara referring to himself in the third person, has had repeated encounters and carried out dialogues. So, so, so the Majmal Bahrain is the culmination of Dara Shukur's dialogues and meetings with Hindu ascetics. And of them, he mentions Baba Lal, uh, by name, uh, but indeed um, there are several others whom he also considered to be these unity affirmers, the Mavahedon Ehind. And we can get a sense of some of them through this image that is now in the Victorian Albert Museum. It's a, it's a rather large painting compared to some of you know, the other smaller formats of, of Mughal paintings. Um, uh, that uh, seems stylistically, uh, according to art historians I've discussed this with, to be you know, dated to the 1650s, which is when Dara Shukru was you know, fully immersed uh, in this work. And we can see uh, on top standing, there are a range of Sufis. Um, often th these are the founders of some of the major Sufi schools, as well as some of Dara Shukru's own Sufi teachers. And in the middle, there are some Sufis who are swooning in, you know, in different uh, kind of states or uh, ecstatic states. And arrayed at the bottom are these Indic ascetics who are seated. Uh, and they are mainly uh, sons and, and yogis. Um, we can see if we look at them kind of from, from right to left, which, you know, if we go by the direction of the Persian script, perhaps, you know, that's a good way to also look at, uh, at uh, Mughal paintings also. Uh, Chetan Swami, who, uh, someone who seems to be Chetan Swami, it's the only one that's not clearly labeled, uh, who's the teacher of Baba Lal. Baba Lal, and then Jadrup, who is an ascetic who had a lot of uh, encounters with with Jahangir, in many ways, Darashukur's dialogues with Baba Lal uh, really mirror in both the, the visual and kind of textual uh, memorializations of this Jahangir's dialogues with, with Jadrup or Chidrup, Goraknath and Matsyendranath, the Nath yogis, um, you know, various other ascetics, including Kabir and uh, the son of Kabir, Kamal, Namdev, Ravidas, and so on. Um, so, so we might imagine that for Dara Shukho, the idea of, the, of these Indian unity affirmers, it's a very broad category. He's, he's, so he, he's really equating the ideas of these sons and yogis with the, uh, the mystical truths of the Sufis. And what he's trying to do in the Manchur Bahrain is to show that these are actually equivalent. So he, you know, he takes an idea, um, you know, uh, uh, he takes the idea of Maya, for instance, you know, or, or, um, which, 
can be seen as, as the sort of illusion uh, that is also the creative force behind the phenomenal world. And then he compares that with something from the Sufi tradition. So, so it's the work, of, it's, it's a book of equivalences where he actually believes that they're at, at the core of these different traditions. There may be a difference in vocabulary, but there actually is a kind of a sameness that one can fathom if one has reached a certain spiritual level. That, so Dharashukur's next major project was his Sirri Akbar. And um, he actually writes that, uh, that he composed this uh, at his residence in Delhi. And this is just an image of the building now known as Dharashukur's library. Uh, it's been uh, kind of built over uh, in subsequent periods. There's not uh, perhaps a whole lot of the original structure left, but you know, this, is, uh, this is an image of it. Uh, and at that point, it was uh, by the Nigambod Ghat of the Yamuna River. Uh, and he, uh, he worked there for six months. He got a number of pundits to come from uh, Benares and collaborated with them uh, on these Upanishads. Um, uh, this, is, this is one of the few illustrated uh, versions of the Sirri Akbar. It just has a kind of illustration in the front of space. Again, we see uh, kind of the prince in dialogue with an ascetic. It's a, it's a motif that you, we see a lot in um, uh, you know, representations of him with Sufis, with Babalal and so on, again, referencing you know, an, earlier, uh, some, an earlier visual tradition. And in this work, in the introduction of this work, Dharashuku uh, really seems to to believe that he's reached a kind of spiritual culmination. He talks about reading a number of sacred texts. So you see there's a, there's a change now. He's gone from dialogues with, with people, with whether it's Sufis you know, or, um, or, or these Mubahedon, to actually wanting then to find a text that will give him an even deeper understanding than what he had before of divine unity. So in search of this, um, he, he looks at scriptures from a number of traditions, you know, including Christian scriptures and so on. Uh, but he's still restless. And he's, he's looking for something that truly um, uh, exemplifies the kinds of esoteric secrets that he is seeking. And then he says he finds those in the Upanishads. And, in, and he goes beyond this. He actually says that the Upanishads help in understanding the secrets of the Quran, that he feels that there are some parts of the Quran that are difficult to understand, and that the Quran itself refers to um, a hidden book, a kitab maknun. And he says the Upanishads are actually this hidden book. And typically, when the Quran is interpreted, kitab maknun is not considered to be an actual physical book. But he says the Upanishads, are, they're also a celestial book. Uh, they are a, a book of unity. And, and this, is, so this, is, this is a scripture, just like the Quran is a scripture. And it actually is one that will help us understand the Quran. Uh, and this is you know, a translation from part of his introduction. It becomes clearly manifest that this verse, i.e. referring to a Quranic verse, is literally ap applicable to this ancient book, by which he means the Upanishads. That this indeed is a noble Quran in a book kept hidden, which none touches save the purified revelation from the Lord of the worlds. Since the Upanishad, that is the Upanishads, which is a concealed secret, uh, and the term Upanishad actually you know, can, can mean a, a secret, is the origin of this book. And the verses of the glorious Quran are found in it literally. In this hidden book is the ancient book through which the unknown has become known and the incomprehensible, comprehensible to this fakir. So, so the Upanishads, again, are not just a curiosity. They are a book that actually reveal celestial secrets and the deepest, um, profound secrets of the Quran. Um, <coughs> this is just um, an example of how he um, goes about uh, this translation. Um, it's a manner typical of Persian translations of Indic words, uh, works. Not, it's not really our idea of literal translation that we have um, you know, in our uh, perhaps modern day, though Darashoko claims that you know, indeed he, he, he is doing this. But there's a, quite a bit of interpretation that also goes on and uh, an explanation. 
So uh, in a line that, according to the, the modern scholars, translated, this whole world is to be dwelt in by the Lord, whatever living being there is in this world. Um, so Darushuku dilates upon this, you know, and he kind of adds uh, layers of mystical meaning. Uh, Ish, again, in this, the Sanskrit word means master of all, and Bash, that is, you know, Vasya, has the meaning of veiled, that is, the whole world is veiled and hidden in the master of the world and so on. So we can see, you know, that he, uh, it's a very kind of dilatory translation. There are, there are many passages where you can kind of tell that Darashuku is having a dialogue with, with, with these pundits, his collaborators, and he might ask the meaning of something, and then they will elaborate on that, you know, uh, you know and, and then that is also recorded as part of the translation. Uh, it, it also incorporates the non-dualistic um, gloss or commentary of Shankaracharya in many places, sometimes acknowledged, uh, but more often it's just woven into the translation. So with this, Dara Shoko has done many things. Uh, you know, he has translated uh, an Indic work that his ancestors had not translated. Again, you know, so he's gone beyond the Ramayana and the Mahabharat. And, and, and um, um, in addition to this, he actually now has access to the text that he believes unlocks the secrets of the Quran. So this, this is a way in which he augments his own spiritual power also. Um, and clearly, you know, he, Darashuku did have um, a plan to succeed his father on the throne, uh, a plan that was thwarted uh, with the War of Succession. So this is really the last major work that we have from him. But though he never became emperor, the work lived on. And uh, as I conclude, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. So if you look at this, and if you kind of didn't read it, you might think just from the kind of the visual depiction of it that, that it looks like the frontispiece of, of a um, Quran codex. So it's, it's, it's illuminated in sort of a similar way, but it's actually uh, the Siri Akbar, of which there are many manuscripts. So we don't have the one that Darashoko wrote in his own hand or corrected. We have some other things by him, but, but not the Siri Akbar. But Wherever you have a library of Persian manuscripts, and indeed there still are many of them in the Indian subcontinent and many collections elsewhere, you will find a Siri Akbar copy. You know, I've just um, sort of very quickly, you know, I've made a list of 80 or so manuscripts, uh, I keep adding to it. Uh, and, there, and there are many more, many, many more. Um, you can see over here, uh, if you, you may be able to see that it says Om Shri Ganeshaya Namaha written in the Persian Arabic script, and then Om Shri Ram Ji Saha, for, for Saha. So there's an invocation to Ganesh and Ram, written in the Persian Arabic script. And there's a, the Upanishad, um, which, which are really, uh, which circulated in individual manuscripts. They were not, you know, um, necessarily bound into a book. But in this Persian translation, the Upanishads become bound and really, and become a physical scripture as well as the celestial book that Darashoko considered them to be. So they come to be read and received in a different way because of Darashoko's intervention. And indeed, there were many Hindus who used Persian as their main literary language, sort of, you know, the ways in which a Hindu might read the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads in English today. Uh, in, in the Mughal period, um, in the late 17th and in the 18th century, Persian really flourished. The Mughal bureaucracy expanded. There were many Hindus in it. There were many Hindus who for generations had been using Persian. So they accessed their sacred texts through the Persian translations made in the Mughal courts, uh, like Darashukha's translation. So you can see how this is this is a book that wasn't copied just for information. It also had a religious significance. One other example of the afterlives of Darashukha Siri Akbar is in a work, uh, a translation by a prominent Hindu reformer called Kanheya Lal Alaktari. He's not so famous today, but he was um, a close associate of Dayanand Saraswati, who founded the Arya Samaj, who's a very famous um, Hindu reformer and um, whose Arya Samaj still continues today. Now, the Arya Samajis of that time were not particularly favorably inclined towards Muslims. 
you know, this was uh, well into co colonial rule. There were rifts uh, and increased communal divide between Hindus and Muslims. But many Hindus still found it more comfortable to read and write in the Perso-Arabic script. And Kanayalal Alakdari um, wanted to actually revitalize the Hindu community. He wanted to, he kind of felt that, you know, Muslims read their holy books, Christians read their holy books, why aren't Hindus reading their holy books? Uh, and he himself wasn't a Brahmin, he himself probably didn't know a whole lot of Sanskrit, but he, you know, he said, well, Dara Shukur has translated this and we really owe him a lot. So on the basis of Dara Shukur's Persian translation, he produced an Urdu translation of the Upanishads and it went into multiple printings. And indeed, it seems to have had quite a wide audience. So, you know, uh, Dara Shukur could never have predicted this. You know, this is, this is a work that very much for him had an imperial significance. He wanted be, to be the kind of ruler, you know, that, that Akbar was again, or, you know, uh, like the uh, the garden image you vividly provided, uh, Anna, you know, with Babur tending his, his garden with diverse flowers. So um, Dara Shukur wanted to be that kind of ruler who really combined the spiritual and the temporal and sort of, you know, uh, through his own spiritual perfection, you know, tended his, his kingdom. Um, but he could never have imagined that later on, you know, Hindus would be using his Upanishad translation for their own purposes. Uh, and I'm going to end with one last one that has quite a vivid uh, visual uh, image over here. So, um, you know, even in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century, many Hindus were using Persian, again, as, their, as, as a primary literary language. And one of them was um, Hira Lal Bhargav, who um, had a was a major uh, public intellectual and had a printing press, the Hiralal uh, Press in uh, Jaipur, and he printed some of these Upanishads. And um, if you see the image that he has over here, you can see that if it's if you perhaps turn it, and I should have done that also, it looks like the Arabic uh, Allah, but the image when it's when it's kind of placed in this way looks a bit like Om. So it's something that could look like both Om and Allah. Now, interestingly, in Darashukur's Upanishads, it, um, he starts out with a sort of glossary, glossary of equivalences. So he gives the Sanskrit word and uh, the, the Persian word. Um, so for instance, for um, Brahma, the deity Brahma, he says that that is equivalent to the angel Jibril or Gabriel. And he says that Om in the Upanishads means Allah. So this is a very striking visual depiction of this equivalence over here, where it can read as both Om and, uh, and Allah. So I thought I'd just uh, end over here uh, with uh, this, this little sort of snippet of, um, again, Dara Shukur's um, project of making equivalences between Indic and Islamic concepts and how they still, uh, the legacy of this, you know, still continues for quite a while. Thank you very much, uh, Supriya. That was uh, very enlightening, and uh, and it's almost like uh, a a parallel history, dare I say, a secret history, uh, of which very few few people uh, know, uh, especially you know given the kinds of uh, dare I say propaganda these days to divide communities. Uh, this is something that uh, obviously existed and. Uh, is very much part of uh, history, but perhaps in a way also continues uh, to this day among, among um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, people in India and in the broader South Asia. Uh, at this point, uh, before we go into, uh, before we open it up to the audience for questions and answers, I, I would like to take the privilege of being the moderator to ask a couple of questions. Uh, uh, first, uh, the first question is basically for both the speakers, uh, Anna and Supriya. Um, we have used the word uh, syncretism or syncretic uh, for this, uh, this, this particular session. And uh, it, uh, you may be aware of certain discussions about this, this particular term. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are with respect to 
the use of this word to describe the kinds of coming together, for the lack of a better term, or an alternate term uh, uh, of, of communities. So um, I don't know who wants to go first, but since we have you, um, Supriya, on the big screen, uh, why don't you start? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, so, so the term syncretism has a number of connotations, uh, and it's it's very commonly used in South Asia to talk about the kind of religious interaction that um, you know that that was really um, very very common, uh, but seems perhaps anomalous, unusual, kind of utopian, you know, because of uh, the current polarization and, you know, political situation uh, and so on. So, so syncretism, I think, has um, acquired a number of connotations, you know, in, uh, and in everyday use in the subcontinent. Now, uh, there have been a number of academic critiques of using the term syncretism. Uh, and 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 I think the critiques, you know, de, you know, there, there's definitely um, a certain validity there. The idea the, the, there's the uh, the idea that syncretism assumes that there are these two really distinct things that then come together and that form something that's perhaps hybrid and unnatural. Uh, so there's a sense in which you know maybe syncretism isn't. Um, again, according to this critique, uh, perhaps isn't the best way to describe the kinds of religious and cultural interaction that we've had in, in South Asia, because it essentializes these, uh, you know, these different traditions and then views their mingling as, you know, again, um, something, um, uh, something that, that is potentially perhaps problematic. Uh, so I, so I think there's definitely a point to that critique, uh, but I think there's also, you know, maybe maybe there's a there's a way to reclaim the term, precisely because um, of the charge that it carries in South Asia. Again, with both secularism and syncretism, we have some really distinctive South Asian um, uses of these of these ideas, uh, and these are and. Um, which refer to traditions that are, um, you know, that 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 extend um, uh, a fair way back. Uh, I think so. So, so I'm I'm definitely, um, you know, I think there's definitely an argument that one can make for for reclaiming syncretism. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay. Anna, do you want to speak to this uh, word? Um, I. I actually don't have more to add to it than that. I think. Um... Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Um, the other uh, question that I have is that about the study of religion, and in a way, it relates to the previous question. Uh, so, uh, the study of religion uh, took shape in the last two hundred years in the in, in Western academia, with a certain um, conception. Uh, a Western, perhaps an Abrahamic conception of, or a Judeo-Christian, more narrowly, uh, conception of religion. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are with respect to uh, the, its, uh, its application uh, to South Asia, uh, to Islam, to, to, mm -hmm. to Hindu, the Hindu faith, uh, to other faiths in South Asia. Uh, how, how, is that problematic? Is that uh, is that uh, does it create some dissonance or or not? Mm. These are really um, really big questions, and um, you know, interestingly, I mean, this is this is something that I uh, do engage with a bit uh, in my in my current work. It's very complicated because I think you know we. Um, we are the products of, you know, history, you know, of a kind of post enlightenment history with, you know, colonialism and so on. It's hard to, to shake that off and go back to, uh, to another past, you know, as, as though uh, an alternate uh, past. In terms of religion though, there are, um, there are different ways of critiquing this term. The critiques come from different angles. One of the angles is, it, again, it comes from a space that is seemingly inclusive, but I, 
but I find it problematic. Um, in, in this particular angle, there's the idea that Hinduism is not a religion, but other faiths such as Islam are religions. There's, so there's the idea that Hinduism is perhaps you know, diffuse, um, you know, again, doesn't, doesn't have a center, doesn't have a founder, it's perhaps like kind of really flexible, but, but other things are not religious. Uh, and, I, and we actually see that playing out in the current situation uh, in, um, in India where Muslim girls who wear the hijab are being told they can't wear that because they can't wear religious dress in school. But various Hindu symbols of, you know, bindis, tikas, and so on are not considered religious. So then there's a way then in which, um, you know, certain symbols are, again, normalized and viewed as, as not religious, but part of a broader cultural civilizational complex. Uh, and and then Islam is kind of just viewed as as uh, as religious. So there's a there's you know there's a way in which you know a certain tradition is privileged uh, and other traditions are not. So um, again, so that's that's that that is one of the spaces from which this critique comes. Uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't always have to have to work that way. I think a lot of people who critique the idea of religion don't necessarily make this argument, mm -hmm. um, but you know it's very very common. To, to hear whether it's the Supreme Court or whether it's um, you know, a whole range of figures from different, uh, with different ideological um, proclivities who say that Hinduism is not a religion. But then there's a sense in which Islam is considered to be very religious. And then, and by making this distinction then, um, one completely ignores all these spaces of, um, of interaction, of diffusion, um, you know, that, that have existed throughout history. I don't know, Anna, if you kind of... Yeah, Anna yeah. Seastrand, um, do you want to... Sure, yeah, I, I um, just build on that a little bit, thinking <clears throat> about, uh, I think often this issue comes out for me in, when I'm teaching or talking about pre-modern art, because I'm an art historian, and thinking about, um, well, dress, so clothing would be one of these things, or style or architectural components that get reduced to religious identities. So that is Hindu and that is Muslim and uh, the architecture is synchro. I mean, this idea of syncretism also comes out in visual forms and is, um, is deeply problematic because it essentializes every form to a um, religious identity and then to often an ethnic identity. And um, the problem is that we don't have very good words for it. Um, I'm teaching a course right now on India after 1200. So that's basically India after Islam arrives and establishes itself. You know, and there's Islamic or Islamic it forms, and then there's Indic. And uh, even those terms are so problematic. Um, Indic really bothers me because Islam mm -hmm. is is Indi is Indic after a certain point, right? It it um, is a South Asian religion um, in many ways. So uh, this problem of religion and naming and identifying the stuff of the world according to religion is a problem for which I don't have an answer, but is a makes even thinking it or talking about it extremely difficult yes. uh, for us and for students. Right. And, and, and as you said, it's often, you know, we don't have the words sometimes uh, and, and we're trapped in the words that we have. So uh, this is, a, is an issue. The, my last question is um, about um, the parallel discussion in Indian society taking place while We've been talking about a royal architecture and royal libraries and discussions and princes and so on. And of course, uh, Supriya talked about uh, the engagement of Darashiko with uh, with certain uh, people like uh, the disciple of Kabir and, 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 uh, and other pundits and so on. Perhaps uh, if you could speak to uh, what you may know about uh, these other movements which very few people in our audience perhaps may have heard of, perhaps some have, 
but there, there's, a, there's a certain ferment, there's a vibrant interaction taking place between uh, people of various backgrounds. Uh, the, the Bhakti movement is very strong at this point. Uh, the Sufis, like Chistis, uh, Kabir, uh, Satpanth, uh, and so on. And some of them do find their place uh, in the court, in the discussions of Dini, Lahi, and so on. Uh, and so I was just wondering how much of this is, how much of what's happening in society is interacting with the courts and vice versa, uh, and, and if this has any significance. Well, and, and I, I, hmm, I think you know, both of us can have, I'm sure, answer this in, uh, in, in different ways. Um, it's, you know, again, it's a, it's a bit hard to generalize about large sort of phenomena. There, there has been, uh, you know, kind of recent work on, on bhakti has sort of historicized the idea of bhakti being um, a sort of, um, you know, subaltern movement, a churn, you know, from the grassroots that, that is like a kind of movement. I mean, the ways in which, you know, there's this idea sort of within this tradition where Bhakti is again personified as a woman and so on. Um, so um, I think there are many ways in which um, the courts intersect with other areas when it doesn't want to overstate the the role of the of the Mughal court also that's you know that wasn't certainly the only space of cultural production of course um, you know it does it, it's it is easier of course to access to access works that were that were written so say you know if something was written and was was written in Persian um, you know still the domain of literacy and of circulation of written texts you know it's still fairly limited you know compared to today you know there were um, there are other uh, other ways in which texts circulated that are a bit perhaps harder to measure um i can give you one example you know of you know so there so there was this this figure called surat singh and he was just a regular a petty government official and he lived in the punjab and uh, he was uh, he was a Hindu, uh, probably not a Brahmin, uh, and he had a Sufi peer, and his, the Sufi peer was the seller of seller of oil, so a petty merchant, but highly influential. And um, and he's he's written a kind of lengthy masnavi about about his peer and uh, the the kind of circles of disciples, you know, a lot of Hindu disciples, kind of sort of around this peer. Uh, and it gives us a sense in, of sort of everyday interactions. And it wasn't completely free of tension in that um, he does, he, he talks about what he, the people whom he calls Mughals, you know, perhaps certain aristocrats, government officials, high ranking people in a perhaps negative way. Uh, but, but you get this fascinating picture um, of, again, of Hindus who are all disciples, you know, disciples of this particular peer, who's part of a, a certain kind of mercantile culture. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, and then and there's a circulation again of you know different uh, sort of texts and ideas and uh, 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 and so on. So that's I mean that's that's just one example of something that that wasn't produced in the court or it's sort of you know really in the fringes. Of, of Mughal circles, but you can see um, quite a bit of interaction as well as interreligious interaction here, you know, that, um, so, so it certainly, you know, didn't only happen uh, at the level of the courts. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are, um, of course, there is, um, you know, uh, Akbar and other Mughal sponsorship of temples and so on. Um, so, so Krishna devotion really you know, got a boost during the Mughal period, the main centers in Braj and uh, in um, kind of Rindavan and so on, um, get a boost during during this period. So I think there's a symbiotic relationship also uh, mm -hmm. that, that happens. Good, thanks. Anna, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, I would, I think that's exactly right that we, that you point to this early modern moment as one of extraordinary, um, originality and uh, the bhakti ferment, but also uh, people traveling and traveling perhaps more. Um, Benares is a center of learning and we heard a little bit about that. And um, 
I think of Sri in the South, I think of Sri Vaishnavas at Vijayanagara that uh, really transformed the ideas of kingship uh, at Vijayanagara in the early modern period. Um, and, you know, one of the things I showed the uh, Govinda Dev temple in um, Vrindavan was built in 1590 by Rajaman Singh, who was the highest ranking noble under Akbar. His father had been initiated by um, into the Chaitanya sect. And so we have to think about uh, these movements of people and teachers and um, as part of the broader intellectual, religious and political landscape. Thank you. Okay, I think we are well on time, uh, aren't, aren't we, Ruhi, as far as uh, the Q&A goes? Uh, I just realized my brain was in another time zone when I said nine o'clock would be the Q&A. I meant eight o'clock, but <laughs> right. so completely in a different time zone. So um, we do have some time, at least for the, the audience, to ask uh, some questions. And uh, what we usually do here at the Friendship Circle, because... Um, you know, we used to meet over tea and samosas and socialize and in person. Mm -hmm. And then because of the pandemic, we're obviously uh, doing this virtually. Um, I know a number of people had joined us, I think, from Dubai and from India, I understand, um, from the U.S. as well as uh, in other parts of Canada. We, we uh, encourage people to uh, just um, say hello. So... Um, you know, it, it's, it is a friendship circle and we love to meet new people. And, and if there's anyone here who would just like to um, say hello to us <laughs> and where you're calling from and uh, or if you're representing an organization, um, we'd love to, uh, to hear from you. And then if anyone has questions, please jump in. Remember to unmute your microphone. Hello, my name is Shalina Fazil. I'm from Calgary. And uh, I have never, ever heard any part of history of India. So this was really interesting for me. And I'm curious about the person she was talking about because I originally lived in Africa. So my history was just a Muslim history. So this was really interesting. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Shalina. Anybody else? Feel free to jump in. Uh, there's a couple of people. Arif, uh, you want to go ahead? Um, that was a, a brilliant uh, presentation. I, I applaud both speakers. I have a question uh, which is somewhat off the wall question uh, for Professor Gandhi. It's, uh, I'm going to ask you to channel Laurent Binet um, and, and speculate, reimagine history as they would have unfolded, particularly the social, uh, maybe Hindu, is Muslim relationship history, how that would have unfolded had Dara Siko become, been the victor. And Arif, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Vancouver. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, well that's, um, you know, that's, that's, it's a very big question. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's one that is very often brought up and discussed uh, in the in the subcontinent. Um, I, I think people people do love to, to speculate, because of course, after after Shah Jahan, we had we had Aurangzeb who ruled and had a fairly stable kingdom till uh, 1707. But then you know, there was a fair bit of instability, a kind of um, uh, lots of rulers kind of toppled in quick succession. And then we have the Battle of Plassey in 1757. So, you know, quite a swift decline from there. So I guess the question of, you know, what, what South Asia would have looked like, or what, you know, the subcontinent would have looked like had Dara ruled instead, uh, is also related to perhaps a wistfulness about colonialism, you know, about, you know, maybe what if they had actually been maybe a better ruler and then maybe all those succession of events may not have happened and and then India you know may not have you know what if India had not been ruled by the British and it's really it's a difficult question and it's partly because um you know of um there's just so many complicated reasons as to how how the East India Company was so successful, you know, even even in 1757, and then with Aurangzeb, um, 
Yeah, I think it's not connected to the question of his religious policy alone. Um, I think we see that Dara Shoko wanted to rule again on the on the model of his of his great grandfather Akbar, and to a lesser extent his grandfather Jahangir, though he he was not fond of his grandfather. Um, but there are also structural um, problems uh, and structural issues that were uh, connected, you know, with the uh, with the empire, um, the constant need to. Um, to, to defend and expand the borders, wars that had really kind of sort of drained, um, uh, drained the reserves, including even Shah Jahan's um, kind of adventures in Central Asia and his, again, you know, expensive uh, campaigns in Kandahar and so on. So I think there are a lot of st structural reasons uh, that um, also affected the kind of decline and decentralization of the Mughal Empire. Um, so, so it's it's hard it's it's hard to say if Dara Shogo you know could have uh, actually saved it. If I could just uh, have a quick follow up. So uh, uh, one aspect that I I'm, I'm by no means an expert in this area, um, but the impression that I have from the little that I have read um, often points to Aurangzeb as being you know having made the frictions that were already present and. Uh, earlier, but having made them much worse through uh, in a, a more focus on persecution, for example. And, and I guess the question is, to what extent would those frictions have been mitigated or even uh, you know, diminished had Darasiku become the emperor? In other words, are we seeing, you know, could you imagine a path? I, I understand. I am you know, putting you in an awkward situation. Um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, the author Binet did exactly that. He took the Aztecs back to Europe when Columbus, led, when I think it was the conquistor stores landed in, uh, in Central Asia. He had them follow them back to Europe and take over, which mm -hmm. changed history. Um, so I'm asking okay. you to speculate uh, yes. about an alternate okay. so, history. So, you know, it's, it's actually, it's, it's complicated because you had to be pretty ruthless to be an emperor. So soon, you, you know, Shah Jahan got a lot of younger members of his family killed. You know, he had a very bloody path to the throne. Uh, people remember Aurangzeb's fratricide, but, you know, not quite Shah Jahan's, you know, um, kind of elimination of, um, you know, all the young princes and things and people who could be threats to him. Um, then, Shah Jahan too got a bunch of temples demolished in Banaras soon after he, he became emperor. It was, it was his way of really establishing power. Most, uh, apparently a lot of these were temples under construction. The idea was you know, no new temples as opposed to sort of older ones. Uh, again, he also you know, supported pundits and supported temples and had great relationships with, uh, with, with Rajputs. Uh, but he he did this as uh, as an as an act of you know sort of showing his uh, authority um, so, soon after becoming emperor and you know after his kind of years in exile and so on. Um, Aurangzeb had much more Rajput support during the War of Succession than Darashuko. Darashuko tried to get it. They were both wooing the same uh, Rajput nobles, you know, who of course had their own armies and you know could have supported them. And Aurangzeb was sending envoys with diamond rings and nice gifts to them. Dara Shukur was also writing to them. And once they saw which way the wind was blowing, they joined Aurangzeb, even those who had earlier been with Dara Shukur. And Aurangzeb too, at this point, was writing very nice letters to, you know, for one, for instance, to Rana Raj Singh, where he said, "I'm going to follow the, you know, in the footsteps of my forefathers, who really enabled people of different religions to live together peacefully, and all of that." Um, and he's and he he actually writes this in a in a kind of a letter and puts his own handprint in it on it to show how, um, you know, how much he actually he meant it. And for a while. His method of rule was not all that different. He still continued with the customs. He, in fact, had a farman issued in Benares again for you know for um, um, uh, for the protection of Brahmins and temples and so on. So so Aurangzeb was um, he then later did change the tenor 
of his rule. It was not as lavish and extravagant as Shah Jahan's. It was much more austere, you know, when it came to, uh, you know, um, supporting a number of cultural activities and so on. And uh, and it and it was more legalistic, you know. So there was he, Aurangzeb too apparently had an interest in in reading the poetry of Rumi. He was also interested in you know reading Ghazali and so on. He had he had Sufis come to his court, but his. Uh, his was a more ascetic style of uh, of, of um, sacred sovereignty. You know, it wasn't. It was not um, similar to the to you know Jahangir or Akbar or so on. Thank you. By the way, that was uh, Professor uh, Arif Babul, who is a physicist and astronomer. No one could have guessed. I imagine imagine people who don't know him. So thanks for those uh, really intriguing questions, those incisive questions, Arif. I, we have one more uh, question that's perhaps that we can squeeze in. Uh, we have a hand, up, another hand up. So just yes. as, I, yeah. thank, thank you. Yes, this is uh, this is Rashmi Sharma. Um, I was in Delhi, but now I'm back in uh, Ottawa. And uh, first of all, thanks so so much to Ruhi and Stephen for uh, pulling the circle together and organizing this wonderful evening and to our speakers for sharing so generously their insights into a fascinating topic and, and drawing us in so skillfully uh, into it. So my question is that we had and you shared with us the description of these dialogues that were occurring hundreds of years ago and patrons, high level patrons uh, of religion, of all religions. What is happening today? Are these dialogues at the religious level uh, occurring? Um, between religious actors. Certainly there is a lot amongst uh, academics and there is a lot amongst uh, artists to some degree. I've studied Indian classical dance, but in Qatar can, of course, was brought up in both the Muslim and the um, Hindu aspects of it. So, but in the fields that matter and also what can be done to advance these dialogues to kind of diffuse the polarization that is taking place right now uh, increasingly. So thank you. Thanks. Well, uh, that's a thank you. I mean, I think that's a that's really important and challenging task. Um, you know, I don't think it's uh, it's one that has uh, easy answers. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, in today's polarized atmosphere, it's really difficult to engage in such dialogues. And and even when people uh, try to do so, uh, you know, it it can um, they can they can land up in in, in trouble. You know, I'm th I'm thinking of. Um, uh, of a uh, of a Muslim peace activist from the Khudai Khidmatkar Association who actually went on a peace journey to visit various Hindu temples and then got arrested because someone con concocted some kind of story, you know, um, sort of wanting to sabotage that. So, uh, you know, I think I think it requires um, definitely uh, courage and persistence to do so. And you know, and it seems that that everyone on this on this call is is interested in that. So that's you know that's really encouraging. Um, you know, I think I think we need to to absolutely um, keep the dialogue going um, amid the uh, amid the, the polarization. Yeah. I'll just uh, second that, that I think that there is no imperial court anymore. So everything is devolved into these, into smaller arenas, but uh, what you're doing here is so important. And I thank you for bringing us out of the ivory tower and allowing us to talk with you because that is so very important. And I, I think, uh, I, I, I just... Sorry, I'll just make some a final comment building on that, uh, you know, on what Anna just said, because, yes, there is no court. And, and of course, when there was a court, a, a, a royal court, uh, obviously it took courage among people like Akbar and, and Shah Jahan and Darashiko uh, and foresightedness, or farsightedness, uh, to be able to 
engage in these kinds of discussions and activities, uh, which is perhaps to be encouraged even in our time. So uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Ruby. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you, Dr. Kareem. That was, that whole discussion has been absolutely fascinating. And the images were mesmerizing, but we were so lucky um, that uh, Dr. Asher, although she could not be here, um, we're very grateful to Dr. Seastrand uh, to share uh, such rich images from a time that many of us probably can never imagine because it's, it's from a completely different era. And, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering if we can go maybe just a few minutes over time. I know we're supposed to end at nine o'clock, but um, I think this is really important in terms of, you know, if, if we're able to draw this back to Canada and the question uh, we posed at the beginning, is there something we can learn and incorporate or adapt? Um, okay. And if someone could very quickly maybe uh, just touch upon that. This is something I thought Santa was interesting. Huh? This is something by Ottawa News Heart Brain Connection. We see. Who's speaking? Okay. Hello. That was just Hello? background. That was just a background noise. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I think. Uh, if if uh, either Dr. Uh, Seastrand or Dr. Gandhi could um, perhaps offer some insights on, uh, you know, in a country like Canada, which is very young, you know, we still have opportunity to to build new models of cooperation as we uh, as we diversify. And uh, what are a few uh, thoughts that come to your mind? Um, that uh, in terms of social innovation, what do you think we might be able to do that can take us down the path uh, where, um, uh, do, you know, D D Professor Babul was asking you to imagine an alternative universe uh, in, in Indian history. Um, but in reality, here in Canada, we still have an opportunity to, to shape the future. So what are some ideas you think that we could adopt? Um, I, think, I think there are a number of, um, of ideas um, and, and, and kind of metaphors uh, that, uh, that can indeed have rich possibilities for today. Uh, one thing that immediately comes to mind is that of translation. You know, the, uh, translation again as, uh, as, uh, as movement of you know ideas, languages, people, and uh, and so uh, and so on. Um, so the idea that uh, that through translation, you know, one can one can sort of understand the other, and um, you know, the the act of translation, you know, in these in these dialogues, again, it um, of course it rendered the Sanskrit text into Persian, but it also um, it was transformative. It also changed the Persian. It added new new ideas and concepts that sort of that became part of that. So it so so it's a it's a process of dialogue that that really um, kind of is uh, is mutual and that has a mutually transformative effect. Um, also also that of dialogue. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, that's that's a, it's a prominent motif in these in these courts, um, and I think so. That's definitely uh, something to um, uh, to learn from. I think, uh, and Dr. Seacrest, uh, Sea Strand, sorry. Um, I I think um, even as you started and you did, uh, did a land acknowledgement, I was struck by it because we're on Zoom. Um, so, but uh, Minnesota, of course, is to um, indigenous land, and um, and I think uh, this idea of reading, of of share, of translation, of shared dialogues, and shared reading is a way to think not only about the past and uh, where we are, but also about the future. And I think you're thinking about Canada and thinking about it, or the U.S. for that matter as a diverse, um, a diverse population of, uh, there are many texts to read and to share. And I guess my encouragement would be to read and dialogue broadly. 
Well, th thank you very much uh, f for that. And um, I see that we have come to an end. And um, for those who could not ask uh, their questions, uh, feel free to email them to us um, in the contact us section of our website. And we'll make sure that, uh, you know, perhaps if the speakers don't mind, we might continue the dialogue virtually. Uh, and if anyone has questions, we might send them all over to you and, and we can continue the discussion that way. Um, also, um, Stephen, I wanted to thank you very much for, um, for, for <laughs> coordinating the Zoom uh, call for all of us. And um, I think Rahil, um, uh, very quickly, uh, if, if you can, within a minute or 30 seconds, just quickly, uh, Rahil Khan um, uh, is a, a friend of ours in Ottawa who is uh, planning on organizing, I think, further lectures like this. And uh, uh, so if he wanted to talk about the Mahatma Gandhi um, uh, new generation leaders, uh, Rahil, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me, Ruhi? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I'll be quick. Uh, Adab, uh, namaskar. Thanks again to Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Sistran for making us all smarter and more open-minded with their respective talks. Uh, I know people have Zoom fatigue at this point, so I won't go too long. Um, I'm the co-founder of a nonprofit here in Ottawa called Mahatma Gandhi Next Generation Leaders, which tries to translate Gandhian principles for demographic groups in Canada and India who are very far removed from Gandhiji. And one of the objectives is to do things like today, which is to reduce social divides through mutual understanding and education. Um, me and Sonish Azam from MGNJL have been supporting ICFC in the development of this event. And this event is actually an appetizer for a longer series of panel events uh, we hope to launch in the fall, which will be called Salam Pranam, which will continue to explore uh, the examples of positive interactions between Hinduism and Islam in the evolution of Indian religion and culture. And this will be done in collaboration with the PEM Gallery in Boston, Carleton University here in Ottawa, and the University of Bristol in the UK. So I hope today's panel event whetted your appetites for a deeper exploration and conversation about the themes and questions raised today. So stay tuned for more information about that series of events. Thank you, Ruby. Most welcome, and thank you, Rahil, for that. And we're definitely looking forward to taking part with you in that uh, in the fall. And uh, one, uh, Dr. Kareem, um, thank you so much for uh, moderating uh, this very, very complex <laughs> and very rich um, panel and topic. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I think one hour, two hours simply cannot do justice to. Uh, you know, such such um, deep and profound topics that uh, were covered today. So thank you uh, for um, for so skillfully uh, moderating today's panel. And um, I, I can't see Dr. Kareem on the screen. Stephen, can we bring Dr. Kareem back on? That's um, your view. There we go. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much. And uh, I think Stephen wanted to quickly, uh, you know, thank one of our volunteers. Um, but before we lose any more people, uh, you know, we are extremely grateful to our two speakers, um, not only for sharing their uh, long years of <laughs> in-depth study and knowledge. Uh, I think all the professors in the group know uh, how long it takes to develop that level of expertise. And so we are very, very fortunate to have been joined by Dr. Uh, Seastrand and, and Dr. Gandhi. So we do hope to continue the dialogue. Um, we have a number of other initiatives we'd like to speak to you offline uh, and, and Dr. Kareem as well. And uh, once again, thank you for uh, for enriching um, all of our uh, minds this evening and, as Rahil put it, wetting the appetite for uh, exploring this very important uh, uh, dialogue further. So without um, uh, any more time from my side, Stephen, did you want to quickly uh, say a few yeah. words about our volunteer of the year. <laughs> yes, um, so a couple of quick things. One, uh, once again, uh, thank you to Rahil for um, initiating uh, a, a broad idea, um, which 
this talk was the first piece of. So thank you, Rahul, for this. Um, the second thing I wanted to do was uh, just to say uh, some words about Anil, who is not with us this evening, unfortunately. Um, but Anil Agrigwal has been a, a part of ICFC since the very beginning. Um, he has volunteered since day one. He has been the original webmaster for ICFC. Um, so he was responsible for the design of the original website. Um, and he's also responsible for the single-handedly transitioning our website to our new WordPress version. So he is also you know, responsible for that wonderful design as well. Um, and throughout this past year, during that transition, he has been an absolutely wonderful support in developing the new website, helping with the updates, uh, providing such wonderful training and advice um, anytime I asked for, for it. Um, and so honestly, from the point of view of the website in particular, we could not have done what we have done, especially in this last year in the transition to the new website without his help. Um, so he certainly stands out as our uh, volunteer of the year for 2021. So a uh, big thank you to Anil for all that he has done. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Stephen. And uh, to Dr. Daheja, if you're listening or if you see this on video, uh, our very um, best wishes from ICFC on your retirement. Uh, from your medical practice as an aller uh, allergist. And uh, uh, Dr. Deheja was uh, another uh, significant volunteer who's organized a number of ICFC seminars for us and even presented at ICFC as an author, radio host, and, and a professor of Indian studies at Carleton University. So without uh, our members and the support of our volunteers, uh, we would not be here today. And uh, a, a big thank you to my fellow board members and, and to Stephen. So, um, and to all of you uh, who, has, who joined us, uh, we um, would like to invite you to sign up with ICFC for future events. And we'll be starting up again with a new theme in the spring. So stay tuned and thank you all again for joining us. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.